The twins stood on the sidewalk outside the bookshop, glass from their broken windows crunching under their feet, watching as Nick produced a key. But we can't just leave, Sophie said firmly. Josh nodded. We're not going anywhere. Nick Fleming, or Flamel, as they were beginning to think of him, turned the key in the lock of the bookshop and rattled the door. Within the shop, they could hear books sliding onto the floor. I really loved this shop, Flamel muttered. It reminded me of my first very job. He glanced at Sophie and Josh. You have no choice. If you want to survive for the rest of the day, you have to leave now. Then he turned away, pulling on his battered leather jacket as he hurried across the road to the coffee cup. The twins looked at each other, then hurried after him. You got the keys to lock up? Sophie nodded. She produced the two keys on their Golden Gate Bridge key ring. Look, if Bernice comes back and finds the shop closed, she'll probably call the police or something. A good point, Flamel said. Leave a note, he told Sophie. Something short. You had to leave suddenly, some sort of emergency, that sort of thing. Say that I accompanied you. Scribble it, make it look as if you were left in a hurry. Are your parents still over in that dig in Utah? The twins' parents were archaeologists, currently on loan to the University of San Francisco. Sophie nodded. For another six weeks, at least. The, we were still staying at, with Aunt Agnes in Pacific Heights, Josh added. Aunt Agony. We can't just disappear. She'll be expecting us home for dinner, Sophie said. If we're even five minutes late, she gets into tizzy. Last week, when the Charlie car broke down and we were an hour late, she had already phoned our parents by the time we got there. Aunt Agnes was 84, and although she drove the twins to distraction with her constant fussing, they were very fond of her. Then you'll need to give her an excuse, too, the female said bluntly, sweeping into the coffee shop with Sophie close behind him. Josh hesitated before stepping into the cool, sweat, sweet-smelling gloom of the coffee cup. He stood on the sidewalk, his backpack slung over his shoulder, looking up and down. If you ignored the sparkling glass littering the sidewalk in front of the bookshop, everything looked perfectly normal, an ordinary weekday afternoon. The street was still, still and silent. The air was heavy with just a hint of the ocean. Across the bay, beyond Fisherman's Wharf, a ship's horn sounded a deep noise lost and lonely in the distance. Everything looked more or less as it had half an hour earlier. And yet, and yet it was not the same. It could never be the same again. In the last 30 minutes, Josh's carefully ordered world had shifted and altered irrevocably. He was a normal high school sophomore, not too brilliant, but not stupid either. He played football, sang, badly, in his friend's band, had a few girls he was interested in, but no real girlfriend yet. He played the occasional computer game, preferred first-person shooters like Quake and Doom and Unreal Tournament, couldn't handle the driving games and got lost in mist. He loved The Simpsons and could quote chunks of episode by heart. He really liked Shrek, though he had never admit it, thought the new Batman was alright and that X-Men was excellent. He even liked the new Superman, despite what other people said. Josh was ordinary. But ordinary teens did not find themselves in the middle of a battle between two incredibly ancient magicians. There was no magic in the world. Magic was a movie special effects. Magic was stage shows with rabbits and doves and sometimes tigers, and David Copperfield sawing people in half and levitating over the audience. There was no such thing as real magic. But how, then, could he explain what had just happened in the bookshop? He had watched shelves turn to rotten wood, seen books dissolve into pulp, smelled the stink of rotten eggs from D spells, and the cleaner scent of mint from Fleming, Flamel, worked with magic. Josh Newman shivered in the bright afternoon sunshine and ducked into the coffee cup, pulling open his backpack and reaching in for his battered laptop. He needed to use the cafe's wireless internet connection. He had names he wanted to look up. Dr. John D., Pernelle, and especially Nicholas Flamel. Sophie scribbled a quick note on the back of a napkin, then chewed the end of the pencil as she read it. Mrs. Fleming unwell. Gas leak in the shop. Gone to hospital. Mr. Fleming with us. Everything else okay. We'll phone later. When Bernice came back and found the shop closed just before the late afternoon rush, she was not going to be happy. Sophie guessed that she might even lose her job. 
Sighing, she signed the paper with a flourish that tore through the paper and stuck it to the cash register. Nicholas Flamel peered over her shoulder and read it. That's good, very good, and it explains why the bookshop is closed too. Flamel glanced over his shoulder to where Josh was tapping fiercely at his keyboard. Let's go! Just checking my mail, Josh muttered, powering off the machine and closing it. At a time like this? Sophie asked incredulously. Life goes on. Email stops for no man. He attempted a smile and failed. Sophie grabbed her bag and vintage denim jacket, taking a last look around the coffee shop. She had the sudden thought that she would not be seeing it again for a long time. But that was ridiculous, of course. She turned out the lights, ushered her brother and Nick Fleming, and Flamel, through the door ahead of her and hit the alarm. Then she pulled the door shut, turned the key in the lock, and dropped the keychain through the letterbox. Now what? she asked. Now we get some help, and we hide until I figure out what to do with you both, Flamel said. We're good at hiding. Perry and I have been doing it for more than half a millennium. What about Perry? Sophie asked. Will D harm her? She'd come to know and like the tall, elegant woman over the past few weeks as she came into the coffee shop. She didn't want anything to happen to her. Flamel shook his head. He can't. He, she's too powerful. I've never studied this sorceress arts, but Penny did. Right now, all Dee can do is contain her, prevent her from using her powers. But in the next few days, she will start to age and weaken. Possibly in a week, certainly within two, he would be able to use his powers against her. Still, he would be cautious. He would keep a trap behind wards and sigils. Flamel saw the look of confusion on Sophie's face. Or magical barriers, he explained. He'll only attack when he is sure of victory. But first, he will try to discover the extent of her arcane knowledge. Dee's search for knowledge was always his greatest strength. And his weakness. He absently panted his pockets, looking for something. My Perry can take care of herself. Rhyme me to tell you the story sometime of how she faced down a pair of Greek lame. Sophie nodded, though she had no idea what Greek lame were. As Flamel strode down the street, he found what he was looking for. A pair of small round sunglasses. He put them on, stuck his hands in the pockets of his leather jacket, and began to whistle tunelessly, as if he hadn't had a care in the world. He glanced over his shoulder. Well, come on! The twins looked at each other blankly, then hurried after him. I checked him out online, Josh muttered, looking quickly at his sister. So that's what you were doing. I didn't think emo could be that important. Everything he says checks out. He's there on Wikipedia, and there's nearly 200,000 results of forum on Google. There are over 10 million results on John, for John D. Even Penele is there, and it mentions the book and everything. It even says that when he died, his grave was dug up by people searching for treasure, and they found it empty. No body and no treasure. Apparently, his house is still standing in Paris. He sure doesn't look like an immortal magician, Sophie muttered. I'm not so sure I know what a magician looks like, Josh said quietly. The only magicians I know are Penn and Teller. I am not a magician, Flamel said without looking at them. I am an alchemist, a man of science, though perhaps not the science you would be familiar with. Sophie hurried to catch up. She reached out to touch his arm and slow him down, but a spark, like static electricity, snapped into her fingertips. Ah! She jerked her hand back, fingertips tingling. Now what? I'm sorry, Flamel explained. That's an after effect of the, well, what you'd call magic. My aura, the electrical field that surrounds my body, is still charged. It's just reacting when it hits your aura. He smiled, showing perfectly regular teeth. It also means you must have a powerful aura. What's an aura? Flamel strode on a couple of steps down the sidewalk without answering, then turned to point to a window. The word tattoo was picked out in fluorescent lighting. See there, see how there's a glow around the words. I see it, no Sophie nodded, squinting slightly. Each letter was outlined in buzzing yellow light. Every human has a similar glow around their body. In the distant past, people could see it clearly, and they named it the aura. It comes from the Greek word for breath. As humans evolved, most lost the ability to see the aura. Some still can, of course. 
Josh snorted derisively. Flamel glanced over his shoulder. It's true. The order has even been photographed by a Russian couple called the Carlelians. The electrical field surrounds every living organism. What does it look like? Sophie asked. Flamel tapped his finger on the shop window. Just like that, a glow around the body. Everyone orders is unique. Different colors, different strengths. Some glow subtly, others pulse. Some appear around the edge of the body, other auras cloak the body like an envelope. You can tell a lot from a person's aura, whether they are ill or unhappy, angered or frightened, for example. And you can see these auras? Sophie said. Flamel shook his head, surprising them. No, I cannot, but Petty can sometimes. I know how to channel and direct the energy, though. That's what you were seeing earlier today. Pure auric energy. I think I'd like to learn how to do that, Sophie said. Flamel glanced at her quickly. Oh, be careful what you wish for. Every use of power has a cost. He held out his hand. Sophie and Josh crowded around on the quiet side street. Flamel's hand was visibly trembling. And when Sophie looked into his face, she noticed that his eyes were bloodshot. When you use auric energy, you burn as many calories as you had run a marathon. Think of it like draining a battery. I doubt I could have lasted very much longer against D back there. Is D more powerful than you? Flamel smiled grimly. Infinitely. Shoving his hands back into his pockets of his leather jacket, he continued down the street. Sophie and Josh now walking on either side of him. In the distance, the Golden Gate Bridge began to loom over the rooftops. D has spent the past five centuries developing his powers. I have spent that same time hiding mine, concentrating only on those few little things I needed to do to keep Parnelli and myself alive. D was always powerful, and I dread to think what he is capable of now. At the bottom of the hill, he paused, looking left and right, then abruptly turned to the left and headed into California Street. There will be time for questions later. Right now we have to hurry. Have you known Dee long? Josh persisted, determined to get some answers. Nicholas Flamel smiled grimly. John Z was a mature man when I accepted him as my apprentice. I still took apprentices in those days, and so many of them went on to make me proud. I have had visions of creating the next generation of alchemists, scientists, astronomers, astrologers, and mathematicians. These would be the men and women who would create a new world. D was probably the finest student I ever had. So I suppose you could say that I've known him for nearly 500 years, though our encounters have been somewhat sporadic over the last few decades. What turned him into your enemy? Sophie asked. Greed, jealousy, and the Codex, the book of Abraham the Mage, Flamel answered. He's coveted that for a long time, and now he has it. Not all of it, Josh reminded him. No, not all of it, Flamel smiled. He walked on, with the twin still on either side of him. When D was my apprentice in Paris, he found out about the Codex. One day I caught him attempting to steal it, and I knew then that he had allied himself with the Dark Elders. I refused to share its secrets with them, and we had a bitter argument. That night, he sent the first assassins after Petty and me. They were human, and we dealt with them easily. The next night, the assassins were decidedly less than human. So Perry and I took the book, gathered up our few belongings, and fled Paris. He has been chasing us ever since. They stopped at a crosslight. A trio of British tourists were waiting for the light to change, and Flamel fell silent. A quick glance at Sophie and Josh, warning them to say nothing. The light changed, and they crossed. Tourists heading to the right, next to Flamel and the twins moving to the left. Where did you go when you left Paris? Josh asked. London, Flamel said shortly. D nearly caught us there in 1666, he continued. He loosed a fire elemental after us, a savage, mindless creature that almost devoured the city. History calls it the Great Fire. Sophie looked over at Josh. They had both heard of the Great Fire of London. They had learned about it in world history. She was surprised by how calm she felt. Here she was, listening to a man who claimed to be more than 500 years old, recounting historical events as if he had been there when it happened. And she believed him! D came dangerously close to capturing us in Paris in 1763, Flamel continued, 
And again in 1835, when we were in Rome, working as booksellers, as it happened. That was always my favorite occupation, he added. He fell silent as they approached a group of Japanese tourists listening intently to their guide, who was standing beneath a bright yellow umbrella. When they were out of earshot, he continued, the events of more than a century and a half earlier obviously still fresh and bitter in his memory. We fled to Ireland, thinking he would never find us on that island at the edge of Europe. But he pursued us. He had managed to master the control of rights then, and brought two over with him, the disease white and the hunger white, no doubt intending to set them on our trail. At some point he lost control of the creatures. Hunger and disease ravaged that poor land. A million people died in Ireland's Great Famine in the 1840s. Nicholas Flamel's face hardened into a mask. I doubt if Dee even paused to think about it. He had always had nothing but contempt for humankind. Sophie glanced at her brother again. She could tell by the expression on his face that he was concentrating hard, trying to keep up with the deluge of information. She knew he would want to go online and check out some of the details. But he never caught you, she said to Flamel. Not until today, he shrugged and smiled sadly. It was inevitable, I suppose. Throughout the 20th century, he kept close, getting closer. He was becoming more powerful. His organization was melding ancient magic with modern technology. Perry and I hid out in Newfoundland for a long time until he loosed dire wolves on us. And then we drifted from city to city, starting on the east coast in New York of 1901 and gradually moving westward. I suppose it was only a matter of time before he caught up to us, he added. Cameras, videos, phones, and the internet makes it so much harder to remain hidden nowadays. This book, this codex he was looking for, Josh began. The book of Abraham the Mage, Flamel clarified. What's so special about it? Nicholas Flamel stopped in the middle of the sidewalk so suddenly that the twins walked right past him. They turned and looked back. The rather ordinary-looking man spread his arms wide, as if he were about to take a bow. Look at me! I am older than America! That is what's so special about the book. Flamel lowered his voice and continued urgently. But you know something. The secret of life eternal is probably the least of the secrets in the Codex. Sophie found herself slipping her hand into her brother's. He squeezed lightly and she knew, without his saying a word, that he was as frightened as she was. With the Codex, D can change about, said, said about changing the world. Changing it? Sophie's voice was a raw whisper, and abruptly the May air felt chilly. Changing it how? Josh demanded. Remaking it, Flamel said softly. D and the Dark Elders he serves will remake this world as it was in the unimaginably ancient past, and the only place for humans in it will be as slaves or food.